this is the topic that we are going to do in our next two lecture is on downstream processing in biotechnology. Okay, um, this lecture will will be sort of like the overall idea for you to to know uh, that after you produce something that involves biotechnology, what you can do to achieve the final product. Um, the technique and the method used for the downstream processing in biotechnology is exactly what other fields is using as well. So it's going to be the same as like chemical engineering and, and, and all other industries, okay? So it's just a matter of application into the biotechnology. Okay, let's have a look at the, um, let's have a look at the, um, at the production process in biotechnology, okay? So um, in general, when we talk about producing something in biotechnology, we are, we are talking about like fermentation most of the time. Okay, but it can be extraction from, from, from the herbs. It can be, um, it can be purification of the, in, um, the, of, um, the production of something from the enzyme and that sort of stuff. So, so this is the production part. So let's say if you are producing something using fermentation, of course, what you have to put in is a fermentation media, okay, for the cells to grow, and you can have all sorts of all sorts of production using all sorts of um, all sort of microorganism. You can use yeast, bacteria, fungi, plant cell, animal cells, or you can use microalgae, or even you can use what we call biotransformation using enzyme and just put um, your substrate in and get the product out. So. Anything in this um, arena is a production state. Okay. So what you get from the production is you get the product, of course, and you also obtain the impurity with your products. Okay. Um, the impurities in your, in your product is, um, I would say, the most difficult thing to get rid of if you compare to something from... Um, chemical process okay we're going to get a lot of a lot more impurities for example if you are doing fermentation you definitely are going to have like nitrogen sauce and that sort of stuff put yeast extract in peptones or you can use molas they are all not clean so they are considered impurities which um contain in your final product Okay, hey, the downstream process is what you do after you get the product out from your production state. Okay, basically they they involve three um, three stage. Okay, you have to separate the product out from the impurity first, and then you have to purify your product. And after your purification, you have to do something to make a final um, a final form of product whether it's going to be liquid, whether it's going to be um, powder or whether it's going to be crystal. So it depends on the type of the product that you are process. Okay, and in downstream processing, sometimes separation and purification um, sort of like going together. Okay, you separate something, so you purify it a little bit you could have more purification to get more pure products. So how much pure purity you want, it actually depends on your end product as well, okay? So designing the downstream process in biotechnology actually depends on, on, on the source of product you have and depends on the application, okay? For example, if you think about producing enzyme, you can produce crude enzyme. You probably don't have to do any downstream process at all. Or if you're producing enzyme and you say that you want it to be so pure, so you have to have a lot of downstream processing. And along the way, you're going to lose some product and that sort of stuff as well. So downstream processing is a big thing in biotech, okay? Um, let me give you two examples, 
Okay, let me give you two examples of, um, of the actual process that's going on and involve biotechnology. The first production process that I'm going to introduce is the bioethanol. Some of you probably know it already. And this is the process from, from an uh, process for, from the, an industry that produces ethanol from grains. Okay, so what they start off is they have grains, okay, they're processing it, they break down um, the, the, the polysaccharide, which is the starch, okay, and then they do fermentation. So when they do fermentation, um, you get cells, and also you get the mash from, from the grains, so you're going to have sort of like a suspended solid in there together with the liquid that contain ethanol. So in this process, okay, this is the production process. You can say, could say that the grain going in, milling the grain sacrification is like the pre-production process. So it's preparing things to produce, okay, to be produced. And the fermentation stage is the, is, is the production stage. After this, all of these are downstream processing because you produce something of course the downstream from the production okay so in ethanol fermentation in ethanol production what comes next from the fermentation is the distillation the distillation for this process okay produces two stream the first stream is the ethanol okay but most of the distillation the first time distillation, you're going to get something like 40% ethanol, not even close to 90%, okay? And from the first distillation, you're gonna have like a stillage. So the solid fraction that happened, all the mash and the cells, okay? For this factory, this stillage will go through another process. We are going to talk about that in a bit. But the ethanol that is the product from the first distillation goes to the rectification, which is also the distillation, but this time to get a more concentrate ethanol. Okay. And after uh, the rectification, there's a limitation on, on, on ethanol distillation that you could get up to only like 95% or 96%, but you know that if you're going to put ethanol into as, as a few ethanol, you have to have something at least 99.5, 99.9, even if you want to mix with the bins, uh, with the with the petrol, and then and then put it in your car. So what they do with that is that they couldn't get more than 96 percent, 95 percent, 96 percent. What they do is they have to bring the water out using another process called dehydration, they use molecular seed dehydration. This is a sort of absorption that we are going to do, uh, that we are going to talk about as well in, in our lecture. That's at the end, you get 99.7% and above, okay? So downstream process doesn't involve just one process, okay? Let's see the second stream. The second stream has a stillage, okay? The stillage has um, um, the mash from the fermentation that including cells as well. So this can be regarded as another product, okay? What they do is they evaporate. That is what we are going to do as well in our lecture. They evaporate, take the water out, okay? And then they dry the mash, the stillage. And then at the end, they put in, in the form of pellets, okay? That's another machine. We are not uh, talking about this thing. We are talking up to the drying. And they make thing, uh, they make the stillage to be the pellet, and they get another product um, called. Uh, this one is called dry distilled grain stillage. Okay, if I remember correctly, I think I think it's correct. Okay, so from from this plant, you see that the production is just one part. Okay, and the big part of the thing is big part of the process is a downstream process, and it's important process because. That is when you're going to get your final product. Okay. Another example that I want to give you is the example of um, producing monosodium glutamate. Okay. Um, I'm using another, um, the process from the not Ajinomoto one. 
I, I think all of you know Ajinomoto, right? <laughs> um, the monosodium glutamate that you put in your food. Okay, so for this process, it involves a lot of downstream process before you get that white crystal you put into your food. The umami things you put into your food. So what they do is um, they have the they have they have the nutrients and they have uh, the microorganism that you use in that fermentation. They fermented it, okay? And after, this is the production process. The rest of this grain is a downstream process. Okay, so it involves a lot of units. So after, after they, they, they do the fermentation, they centrifuge to obtain only the liquid part okay then they evaporate to take water out okay they do hydrolyze okay they hydrolyze uh their fermentation products they hydrolyze them to do something okay you can go and and research more if you are under, uh if you are interested in more details then you, they add sodium hydroxide to neutralize them. So because like when hydrolyzed, they put acid, so they have to neutralize them. Okay. And then what they do next is they crystallize um, the glutamic acid. Okay. Mono sodium glutamate is from glutamic acid and the, the, um, the microorganism do the glutamic acid fermentation. So. First step, they crystallize the glutamic acid and then they filter it okay, to obtain the glutamic acid crystals, then go on and dissolve it again. Okay, So this part is sort of like a separation and first step, purification. Filter it out, re-dissolve it, and then get rid of the color. Okay and then do another crystallization. So at this stage, when they put um, glutamic acid, they add sodium hydroxide, that's when you get monosodium glutamate. Um, then you get, um, you go through the, another crystallization. This is the final stage that you get that monosodium glutamate crystals. Then they centrifuge to remove the mother liquid which is the, the liquid part obtaining only the, the crystal part. And then they dry it, screen to the size before they pack. So like monosodium glutamate that you find in the market involve a lot of downstream processing and fermentation is just a part of it. So I give you these two examples just for you to get some feeling of, of the downstream process in, in biotechnology. Okay, so the downstream process can involve a lot of steps. Okay, so you need to, 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 to understand the concept and have enough knowledge, at least for your stage, to be able to choose or to have the option for you to choose if you actually have to decide something, if you want to produce something, okay? Now, look into steps, okay, in downstream process, which we are going to focus on biotechnology process. Um, downstream process for, for biotechnology, okay, I have, we are going to follow uh, this diagram in, in, in our lecture. So when you producing something, presumably from fermentation or you, any reactors that you have, you may have an insoluble part together with the soluble part. So if you are um, doing fermentation using any type of microorganism, you are going to have a soluble part, which is your media and probably the product that the cell secreted to the media. And you have the insoluble part, which is the, which is the cells basically. Or if your production process involves um, what we call a solid state fermentation, 
you have, of course, the soluble part and you have the cells as the insoluble part, you would also have other particles in there as well as the insoluble part. So the, um, the important part before you're doing anything else, okay, is that you may choose to remove the insoluble part first. So you only deal with the soluble part which contains your product. But if your product is the cell itself, it will be in the insoluble part, okay? Um, when I talked about this, the product that is in the cells, that means it's the intracellular product, okay? So it's like microbial oil, it's intracellular products. Um, um, PHA, which is the um, uh, polyhydroxylacanoate, which is the, the bioplastic that is accumulate inside the cells as well. So in order to take those products out, you need to, to break the cells, okay? So cells could be the, uh, could contain the product and we consider it the insoluble part. So if, if your product is a cell, is in the cell or the cell itself is your product, you have to do the separation, okay? But if your, your product is in the soluble part, you may or may not have to remove the, the, the insoluble part because uh, with some of the method, you can just extract the thing from, from the liquid part without taking away the insoluble part. But if you want a clearer solution or it makes your process better, you can remove the insoluble part. Okay. And um, the technique of the separation actually involved in, in, in other downstream processing as well, just that um, I just want to, to concentrate that if something insoluble, you want to remove it out from the soluble, you could use this method, okay? So for the soluble part, and if your cell is intracellular content, it becomes soluble, then you have to do some methods to make it more concentrate and have a higher purity. So you remove the impurity out, okay? And then you can get your, your product, okay? And in the first stage, your product might not be pure enough. You have to purify it, okay? Until you get a purity you want, and then you have to prepare your product in final form, whether it's going to be a solution or whether it's going to be um, a crystal, a crystals, or um, a powder. So this is the overall idea of the downstream process, okay? What we are going to do today, I hope that we could finish um, this part that up until uh, the cells disintegration. So next lecture, we can deal with the top part here. So that's our plan for today. Okay, first let's see the separation of the insoluble product. Okay. Um, For the in, insoluble part, I would say, if, if, if in more general term, if you want to separate the insoluble part from the soluble part, okay, the three, impo uh, the three important and mostly used um, methods, okay, are these three, okay, coagulation and flocculation. Most of you get the, that question right about the coagulation, flocculation, and sedimentation, okay? So that is one way we can remove the insoluble part from the soluble part. Then the next one is the filtration. This is, um, I think most of us are familiar with the filtration. We will, we will look in, in more depth into that one. And the last part, uh, the last process I want to talk about or introduce is the centrifugation, okay? We, I, I believe that we are using a lot of filtration and centrifugation in, in our work. So um, you, might, you might as well pay a little bit of attention so you, 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 you have something in mind when you actually do, do the method by yourself, okay? After these three 
process, okay, what you will get is you get the soluble part separating from uh, the insoluble part separating from the soluble part, okay? And um, with these three process, you could use them in, in combination, okay? There are a lot of time I see people using coagulation and flocculation and followed by filtration or some people filtrate something and then followed by centrifuge. So this, uh, this method can be, been, uh, can be used in combinations, okay? The first one that we are going to cover is the coagulation and flocculation. This technique is widely used in water treatment. Okay, if you are interested in water treatment approach in using biotechnology, um, these two methods are, are the main are the main thing because it it doesn't involve a lot of um, a lot of instruments and is relatively easy to achieve, especially in wastewater treatment. Now, um, I put coagulation and flocculation together because they are a sort of uh, two process that, that occur one after another. But the main point of both process is you want to form the sediment so you can separate the solid part or the insoluble part out from, from, from the liquid. And coagulation, this question, most of you get it right. Coagulation happen first, okay? Then followed by flocculations. And then after that, you get a big flaw and then you just do the separation. Okay, for coagulation, um, this picture is, um, I took it from the internet. It gives you some idea of how coagulation is, okay? So basically, if you have um, a sort of colloidal um, solution, okay, coagulation is the first thing that that would happen if you want to separate the colloidal solution. So what happened in the colloidal solution is that you have a stable colloid. Um, think about milk, okay? Uh, the cell suspension, if you are doing bacteria, especially bacteria or yeast cell, you, they, they act similarly to colloid. So um, most of the time you put them still, they, they settle a little bit, but, but most of the time they won't, they won't settle out well. Okay, so you have to make it, you have to make the colloid that floating particles to be unstable first. Okay, so you destabilize the colloid. Destabilize the colloid means that you add um, some charge into it, introduce some charge into it, so it attract each other and then start to coagulate, okay? Because coagulate is the same as agglomerate, okay? So bring the bring the particles close to them and then sort of like stick them together, okay? A small force like for this one is ionic force by putting some sort of charge into the solution. So the colloid sort of move close together and start to form a small, um, a smaller particle, uh, a bigger particle, I would say, okay? So um, the coagulation is both physical and chemical process, okay? In order to coagulate, you don't just coagulate the thing by itself, okay? Um, most of the time you have to add coagulant, you have to add some chemicals, or you have to, to introduce the charge into, into the colloid. So to enable the particles to, to, to form um, a small, a, a bigger particle, you aggregate them, okay? Sometimes, um, 
you could do by changing the pH, okay? Um, I see the cases where uh, someone wants to uh, make a flock of uh, the microalgae. They want to harvest the microalgae, they change the pH and then the microalgae start to flock and then they separate them, okay? And um, a natural uh, yeast, some yeast or some bacteria, they, they, they could produce a small, some polymer around them so they can self-coagulate as well, okay? Some, some yeast strain does that. So when because when you when you grow the yeast you um you shaking it a little bit and then it start to form the flock and then settle by itself that happens as well in in, in nature. Now uh, for the coagulant uh, you can add a mineral coagulant or organic coagulant. Mineral coagulant is mostly based on iron salt and aluminum salt. Okay, it's cheap. Okay, it's cheap, but it could affect the pH of the um, of your solution. And since this thing will make the cells, I would say the cells form. If the cells is your product, you will have this stuff as another impurity that adds into the cells as well. You can also use organic coagulant, okay? These are the, the chemical compounds, okay? And the good thing about organic coagulant, it, it doesn't affect the pH. So basically you add something to, to, to introduce charges into the solution. So uh, your solid particles start to agglomerate. After coagulation, you want to form a bigger flock, okay? Um, after, when, when you do coagulation, sometimes it's called micro, micro flock, so it's a flock which is small, okay? After coagulation, you, you would want your solid particle, the micro flock, to form a bigger flock so that it is um, heavier, and it could settle in uh, faster or easier, okay? And um, it's a logical step following coagulation, okay? You do coagulation, you follow by flocculation. So what happened is that it increases in particle size due to the particle aggregation. This time, okay, you have to add what we call a flocculant. Most of the flocculant will be the polymer chain. So the polymer chain itself has, has a charge. So the, the micro flock move itself to attach to the charge and form a bigger flock. Just like what I show in the picture here that you have the micro flock, okay, around, and then you have the, um, the flocculant and this micro flock moved and then attach itself to do the bridging, okay? This, uh, flocculant is a bridging um, agent for this micro flock to, to hang on and then you get a bigger flock. Okay. So the bonding between the stabilized particle and the flocculant could be the ionic bonds or hydrogen bonds. So it's, it's not a very weak force and it's not also a sort of like a big attraction force as well. And the flocculant can be categorized as anionic or non-ionic flocculant, okay? For this sort of flocculant, it will bring a negative charge to the media, okay? And another type of flocculant is the cationic flocculant. This, this sort of flocculant will bring a positive charge to the media. So you need to have some uh, you have to. Uh, you need to have some knowledge, a little bit of what you want to flock. Okay, whether your cells is in the negative charge state. Uh, if you want to uh, flocculating your cells, you need to. You need to know whether your cell is in a positive charge state or the negative charge um, state. Okay. 
um, this coagulant and flocculant is commercially available because they are, like I say, uh, coagulation and flocculation is a big thing in wastewater treatment. So if you if you have to use something, there's always be something available for for your needs. Okay. And this is a general process flow. If you want to do coagulation and flocculation, one important thing is that of course you need to to introduce charges into the solution. Okay, but the particle has to move as well in order for it to start forming something, right? So in coagulation and flocculation, you need to have some kind of mixing tank. Okay, you have to have some kind of mixing. So the particle moves around and when it hit an, uh, another particle, that is when they start forming the, the they start forming the flock. If you don't mix them, they will just stay there and doing nothing, okay? And for the coagulation process, they normally involve flash mixing. Flash mixing means mix very fast, okay? Just to get it to form a, a small flock first. And then in the flocculation state, then you start to mix slower and make sure that the flock, the bigger flock is formed. Because if you if you mix it very fast, you won't be able to obtain a bigger flock. Okay. After the flocculation, then you have a bigger particles and it's easier to to be removed. Okay. I'll just go back to these slides. You see that the particle in the flocculation is a micro flock, is small, and with the same the same thing. With the flocculation, the particles get bigger. You see that the liquid get clearer as well. Now, after the flocculation, you have um, options to remove the flock from the liquid. You can do what we call decantation. Decantation is that you have the settling tank and then just get just get the flock to uh, to fall under gravity, and then you to separate, um, you obtain the clearer solution on, on top there, okay. Or if your flock is floating, if your flock is floating, it's, you can do the flotation. So the flock move to the top of the liquid. You can scrape it out from the top of the liquid and get the clear liquid down the bottom, okay. Or you can simply do a filtration that we are going to talk about next. Okay, in that way, you can remove the flock and separate the liquid. You see that it's a clear, it's a clear separation of the flock from, from the liquid. So this process, like I said, is general for, for, for wastewater treatment, but you can apply, of course, to, to, the proce to the downstream process of other things as well, if it's suit, okay? But, what you need to understand is that in order to produce the, um, to do the coagulation and flocculation, you may have to add some chemical in. So that chemical will be a part of your flock and you have to think about how to get rid of that stuff as well. Okay, and yeah, this is a little bit um, at the end of the coagulation and flocculation is that you have to think that what and where is the product, okay? Whether it's a whole cell, whether it's intracellular product, whether it's a liquid part, okay? If your product that you want is the liquid part, of course you can use coagulation and flocculation, okay? And, but if your product is an intracellular product, you can, you can still use coagulation and flocculation if you, if you have limitation in having, um, your 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 equipment okay because if it is for intracellular product you have your process has to has the cell disintegration so the the flocculate uh, the flocculant and the coagulant may uh, stay with your cell debris so that might be fine for you okay but if your product is the whole cells like 
you are going to produce um, a starter culture like lactic acid lactic acid bacteria starter culture for yogurt production or um, the yeast cell for, for bakeries, you might not want to use coagulation and flocculation because that thing will go with, to, with your cells as well. Okay? So it's a matter of, of what you want, okay? And yeah, just like what I say, how serious if the product is contaminated with the additive, okay? Because this is a very early stage in, in, in downstream process. It will affect further downstream process as well. Like you see that the downstream process does involve a lot of methods. Okay, second things we are going to talk about is the filtration, okay? Um, I think most of us, most of us understand filtration right we, we 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 actually we actually do it a lot right <laughs> we do it a lot um of filtration okay. now let's see the filtration okay filtration is basically the separation of solids by size exclusion okay um there might be some overlap between uh, some overlap of filtration and membrane filtration. Okay, um, we are talking them separately. Okay, because for filtration, if you, you if you just talk about filtration, it's the removal of a visible solid particle. Okay, it's a uh, when I say visible solid particle is when you can see that it is a solid in there. And if you want, uh, and you want to get the solid out and then just get the clear solution. So that is the filtration that we are talking about. But like for membrane filtration, it's based on a similar or eventually the same uh, principles, but the, part, the size of the thing that we want to separate is much smaller than the filtration. So the filtration is more or less the clarification process. So it makes things clearer, okay. But the principle are, are, are similar, um, including, including the term dead-end filtration and cross-flow filtration. In membrane separation, uh, we, we, we normally use a cross-flow um, configuration. Okay, let's see the, the two setup or the two setting of the, the filtration, what have the difference between these two, okay? So when you do filtration, um, you can do it two ways, okay? The first way is what we call dead-end filtration. Another one is cross-flow filtration. And these pictures tell the difference. Okay, take a moment looking at it. Okay, what you have here is you have a membrane, the gray stuff here are the membranes, and the membranes has pore size. So when you are using filtration, you need to know what you want to separate out and what size uh, of the thing you want to separate, and then you choose the correct type of, of uh, the filter and correct, uh, yeah, correct size of the filter, the pore size. Dead end filtration is what just the name said, dead end. When you say dead end, you go somewhere and you were totally stopped, okay? So what happened to dead end filtration is the feed, okay? is the feed going against the direction of the filter surface. So this is a filter, this is the surface. So the feed goes in that way, okay. So what happened is that you have a big particle, bigger than the pore size, it will be caught on the membrane surface, uh, on the filter surface, okay. The thing that are smaller than the pore size of the filter will go through 
and what we call the thing that go through the filter is the permeate or the filtrate. These two terms are the same thing, okay? So you feed something that can't get through the pores, get accumulate on the surface, and then what goes through is what we call permeate or filtrate. Okay. So for the data infiltration, the celery, celery is a mixture of um, liquid and solid. The celery flow perpendicular to the filter surface, just like in the pictures. Only particles smaller than the filter pore size could escape to the filter or the permeate. So this one, you have liquid and you have a smaller particle. Filter cakes deposits on the filter surface. So after a while, the bigger particle is accumulate on top of the filters, okay? And this thing is called the filter cake. It's a cake. Okay, just like the cake that you eat, okay? It's filter cake that accumulate on top of the filter surface. And you can imagine what happened, okay? At the beginning of the data infiltration, your filtration, your, your filtrate will come out very quickly. And, and, it's, um, and it happened fast, okay? But after, after a while, the filter cake starts to accumulate. And when it accumulates like that, it itself acts as another filter layer. So, but, but, but the size, the pore size, the spacing size between those particles are much, much smaller than, than what is on the filter. So it blocks. Okay, it blocks uh, the filtration. It blocks the filtration. And for some times, after a while, you won't be able to, fil to filter your celery anymore. Then that is when you have to, to stop your filtration and then change to the fresh membrane and so on. Okay, so the dead air filtration is good if you want to block all the particle like that and you get all the, all the liquid out from here. But the cake resistance increases very fast. Cake resistance, um, everybody knows resistant, right? So it resists the filtration to go. So if you have a cake buildup, you have a cake resistance that increase fast because the cake build up and it clogged the filter. So you have to stop the filtration changing the new membrane and then you can start doing the filtration again. A good thing about data infiltration is you could get a total separation of the solid and, 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 and your liquid, okay? Because the liquid will all go down that way, okay? Since the cake resistance, the building up of the cake for data infiltration is a big thing, okay? And sometimes um, people just, just want to delay the cake built up. What they use is they're using the filter aids. The filter aids. The role of the filter aids is to increase the porosity of the filter cakes. Okay, so what it does is reduce cake compression and increase filtration rate. Okay, let's see. The filter aid, it increased porosity of the filter cake. How? Because if you apply filter aids, the filter aids, which is bigger, will form a layer before the, the filter cake um, uh, form. So that means that it has a lot of porosity through, through, the, uh, through the filter aids. So it re um, reduce the rate that the filter cake build up. Okay, so it reduces the cake compression as well. The cake compression is that when you have the feed here, imagine it, if you have the feed down that way, you have the cake down that way, you have pressure goes down this way all the time. So this cake get compressed, 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 and the pore within the particle gets smaller, smaller, and smaller. That's when you get a lot of resistance from the cake, okay? 
the filter is can be used as an add mix or pre code. That's two way of using filter. Right? Pre code means that you lay the filter rate uh, on the filter surface before you actually adding fade. Okay. The add mix is that you mix the filter rate together with the salary, which is your feed. So you you mix the filter rate with the feed. And then you do the filtration. Okay. At the end the filter rate will will form the layer on your your, your filter and it helps reduce the cake resistance and and makes your filtration goes longer. Okay. And this is the um example of the filter rates that has that is used in 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 the industry okay you might have heard the word diatomite okay or sea light it is a silica skeleton of the prehistoric plant so it's the organic things that that has a lot of um porosities okay and since it is hard the structure itself is hard so it doesn't get compressed very easily and it provides a lot of like porous for the uh, for the filtrate or the liquid to go through another filter rate that is used industrially is what we call perlite okay perlite is an amorphous volcanic glass so it has um, a strong structure as well, and it, you see that it has a lot of porosities, so it helps with the filtration. However, the use, the use of filterase actually depends on where the product is located as well. So if you are producing cells biomass, and you want to, um, just like I said, um, like for example, like starter cultures for lactic acid bacteria starter culture or yeast for the bakeries. If that cells is a product, you might not want to choose dead end filtration and just hope that you can add the filter rate because in that way the filter rate will mix with your cells. You can't sell that as the starter culture anyway. Okay, so it's one of the things that you have to think about whether you want to use the filtration. Okay, next is the cross flow filtration. What we had before was dead end. Okay, this one is cross flow filtration. Looking at the diagram here, the cross flow filtration, as the name said, cross flow, you flow cross. So the salary flow parallel or tangential to the filter surface. So in dead end, we have from top down, okay, perpendicular to the to the surface. But cross flow is this way, okay. Cross flow filtration is 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 the common practice in membrane separation that we are going to you to talk about next. Okay. So what happened in cross flow filtration is that you have the feed um, going in that way, okay, this direction. And the feed for flow through, not fall through, fall along the membrane, uh, the filter surface, okay? And since the flow goes that way, but you have to permeate or filtrate that still can go through this pore. So you still have permeate and filtrate goes down this way too. But unlike the data infiltration, you need to have a constant flow along this way. So that means that you have a slower cake build up. Okay. Eventually you will have cake build up, but it will go it will go slower. Okay, it will delay the cake build up. So you have to go, you um your feed has to go through. So you still have to have liquid here. It's not like dead infiltration where you, all the liquid goes on that way. Okay, so go across and you can think, I mean, you can think about the fact that if you 
flow fast, you get more disturbance on here, you get less cake repression and that sort of stuff. So we're not going to go into details with all the calculations just to get you to get the idea, okay? So in this one, you have feet going in and since the permeate continuously going down the membrane, okay, the retentate, the retentate is what retain after it go through the membrane, it will get more concentrate, okay? Because more, even though you have a smaller things going down there, but you have some liquid lost through the filter as well. So you have less liquid there, so you get more concentrate, okay? And like I say, it's a general setup for membrane separation. Now, I in this um, in the slide that I'm going to talk about uh, that I'm teaching, you see that I put in a lot of pictures. I just want you to see a lot, so you have some idea. While for for the principle itself, I just want you to get the idea of what each thing is. Okay, this is the example of dead end filtration system. Okay, um, in this in this um, in this setup is what we call a filter press. Okay, a filter press. A filter press. So in this picture, you see a lot of like plate, sort of like um, rectangular plate and stack together. And each plate inside is a membrane. So you have a membrane in the plate and then they stack up just like you stacking your plate and then put together, you put feed in, okay? That's a way of feed distribution. And then this is the dead end filtration, okay? So what, what they have is that these are the blue things here, are the membranes. So basically you have the feed going in, okay? With the use of the pump, the feed is forced through the membrane surface. Okay, and then uh, the filter cake build up, but you have the filtrate or the, re uh, the filtrate going through the membrane and they collect to the top and then go out the system. So in this configuration, you have a lot of membrane surface to work with. So the more plate you have, you have the more surface for the filtration to happen. So if you want to scaling up, you can have one stage 10 plate, but if you, have, if you want more volumes to be filtered, you can add more plate and it can go as long as you want or as long as the machine is designed for. Okay. But like I said, the bad thing about data infiltration is that once you have a lot of cake built up, you have to disassemble this thing and then clean the membrane before it can be reused again, okay? This is the example of the data infiltration also, but it is decided that it can uh, carry out continuously, okay? Um, the picture on the right here is a data infiltration. We use this in our lab, right? So for continuous this and filtration, what they have is that they have the it's a surface thing. You see that you have um, you have the feet going in there, okay, and then you have what we call a moving belt, uh, a moving filter belt. So instead of having the filter stationary, the filter move as a belt along this way. And at the end, they have some sort of a help to remove the filter cake. And then the belt go around to the feed again. And cake wash liquid is what they, you, you put um, liquid in so that you have the filtration going. So it's moving, filter cake is removed moving, filter crack remove, and then you create the vacuum under, under this machine. So the filtrate 
go in the receiver here. So you can do this continuously just to remove the cake. Okay. This is one of the setup industrially in, in industry. Another example of the continuous data infiltration. I mean, people actually people like data infiltration because it's um it's a it's a way that you can totally sort of like totally separate the solid particle and 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 the liquid, but it has the downside of having a cake built up that 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 stops the filtration. That's why people is trying to do a lot of things just to just to keep the data infiltration going forever, you know. So another um, another setup is a rotary dry vacuum filter with scraper discharge. This is another design that we have thing run continuously and having filter cake removed um, continuously as well. The previous example are the horizontal belt, right? This one, they decided that, okay, to save the space and you can do co things continuously as well, is to have um, the rotary drum. So the surface of the drum here is actually the membrane, uh, not the membrane, sorry, actually the filter itself, okay? And um, you have celery that you want to, is your feed. Okay, it's your feet. And this thing, the rotary um, rotate down to the feet. And since the inside is uh, connected to the vacuum pump, okay, to the vacuum pump, so the vacuum will suck the celery onto the surface of of, of this filter and this thing roll all the time continuously and remove the filtrate and put it in the receiver here. So it's actually rotate, 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 rotate. To some point, it has a blade to scrape off the filter cake and then this one go and to the feed again and this thing go on, go on and go on forever. I've seen, um, I've seen people applying this type of filtration with microalgae. Okay. Microalgae is a little bit big, so you can you can actually do this type of thing as well. So it actually depends on your on your filter pore size. What I mean, it, it depends on what you want to 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 to, to separate because it, this is a size separation. Okay, so this is um, the attempt for the use of data infiltration uh, in continuous fashion. Another example I want you to see is a cross flow filtration, okay? This is a laboratory setup because if, if it is um, a big scale setup, you, you probably just see a housing and you don't see anything inside. So I decided that I, I would explain this to you. So this is a membrane system, okay? So um, cross flow filtration, whether it's membrane or whether it's a filter, is, is about the same, it's about the same thing. So this is your like feed tank, okay? You feed things in, you cross flow. So, so basically um, what you put in here will get concentrated along the way, okay, and 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 go out. Okay. One important thing about filtration, ah, oh, another example first. This is a bigger scale, okay. This is a small laboratory scale. This is a bigger scale of the cross flow filtration. Okay, this cross flow filtration is a it has the filter. Um, surface here, so it can be like a ceramic cylinder, that type of stuff here, and then you have your 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 feet going in the housing here. You see that the feet going in the housing here. You have the motor that roll um, the filter here, and then filtration happens here. You have the filtrate coming out here and you have the wind tape going out there. So that's another configuration of the cross flow filtration, okay? And this is a bigger scale, 
this is a bigger scale. The same setting can be done in a bigger scale as well, but for like industry, it has to think about the, the, the application and how they and how they are going to design the system so that it's effective and doesn't use a lot of space as well. Okay, I, this is another example of cross flow filtration. A similar things happen, and you know, you 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 see that it based on the the design that doesn't take a lot of space, but have a lot of filtration um, surface, the filtration area. Because the important things about separation, especially for filtration or membrane separation, is that if you have more surface area for filtration, you will handle more volumes. Okay, okay that, that was about filtration. So we know we, we, we heard about um, dead end filtration and cross flow filtration, and I hope that you might get some idea of the different how how they are different and how they could be applied in 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 real life not in just a laboratory okay so you have some idea of the choice if you need to use this method okay the last the last point that we want to that i want to talk about in the separation of the insoluble products is the centrifugation Okay, for centrifugation, I mean, everyone is using centrifugation, a small one in your lab, centrifugation. For centrifugation, um, separate the liquid, of course, from, from, from the solid. Everybody knows that, right? Um, it is the settling mechanism but under the centrifugal force so in setting in, in in the settling or the sedimentation it's use the gravity for the solid to settle but for centrifugation we use centrifugate centrifugal force and think about this if you are in the car you're in the car um are you ride motorcycle and if you have to go like on the road with the curve right if the road is so flat you will feel like your body will sort of like just go away from from the car to another direction of the curve um, but if the curve is um tilt a little bit then you will feel the force that force you toward that uh, how the curve goes. So that is the the opposite of the the, the centrifugal force and the centrifugal uh, centripetal force is 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 something that you experience when you are in the car and it moves through 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 the curve. Okay, so it's um a force that pulls you toward the center. Um, one example, easiest example. For, for most of the people is the hematocrit. Okay. They use it in the hospital just to separate okay, the, the red blood cell and the serum just to see how much red blood cell you have, right? Or all method of seeing if you have enough red blood cell if you want to donate, but that is the that that is one example of the hematocrit. Okay. Now, let's see the centrifugal, the important things that I want you to think about, about um, uh, centrifugation, okay? These three terms, okay, these th three terms is what you have to think about all the time when you are doing centrifugation work, okay? Um, Okay, for, for the picture on the left, I just put it there, everybody knows that. This is something that we see after we do centrifugation, right? <laughs> we have something in our microtube, we put it in the, centri uh, the centrifuge. With this one, if the lid closed, you, have, you put this side on top, right? So that's why you get the pellet away from, from the center. Okay, in the centrifugation, 
everybody knows rotational speed. It's the setting, right, that you do, whether you want 5,000 RPM, 7,000 RPM, or 10,000 RPM, which is um, rotation per minute. Okay. So rotational speed is how fast the centrifuge rotor spins. So how fast it goes. It doesn't matter whether your rotor is small or large. If it goes this fast, you say it has a certain rotational speed. Okay. So that's what we mostly deal with. But the important thing for centrifugation is not really the rotational speed. It, it is the relative centrifugal force or RCF. Okay. It is the measurement of the acceleration applied to a sample within a circular mo movement. That is the definition. But the, but, but the real point of it is, is the G-force. It is the G-force. You heard of the G-force, right? If you go to um, uh, like, <laughs> I can't think of the word, um, the, the fair. And uh, there were some machine that spins you around, right? When you when when you go play it, and and it it's sort of like you see the force that move towards you and 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 put you against uh, the wall of of the machine. So that is a centrifugal force. Okay, so is this a G force? Is this a force that the astronaut feels when they when they are on a spaceship that going up. So if it go fast, a lot of G-force is, is forcing toward them. So the relative centrifugal force is the, is the multiple of G. Um, I could say that what we're feeling right now is one G, <laughs> right? But if there was something that, that, that the force against us, and and if it is a multiple of of the acceleration, it is the G force. So so relative centrifugal force is important thing in centrifugation than the rotational speed. Okay. Let me show you why. Okay. Okay. Um, the relative centrifugal force by its meaning. Okay, this is a definition, but the point that I want you, I want to show you, is that the relative centrifugal force, it's not only depends on how fast the rotation goes in RPM in rotation per minute. It also depends on the radius of the centrifugation as well, okay? So if you go back to this picture, okay, if the car goes round in this circle, it has one relative centrifugal force, but if the circle is bigger and they goes with the same speed in RPM, they'll feel more force in the car. So basically, the RCF not only depends on the RPM or round per minute, it also depends on the radius of the rotation as well. Okay. And we should use this, when, when we are using a different centrifuge, okay, so for example, if you are separating your cells using a small centrifuge, then you are upscaling and using a bigger RPM, uh, a bigger uh, centrifuge, what you should keep to get the same result is not the RPM. You have to use the same G or the same RF, uh, RCF, relative centrifugal force, okay, to achieve the same thing. Most of the time you get away with this because um, when you are, you are doing your laboratory work, you are using a very small centrifuge, right? It's probably sometimes it's like, um, 15 centimeter rotor, but you probably set it at 
um, 10,000 RP, uh, 10, RPM, but if you are scaling up to a bigger rotor, you, you keep the same RPM, but the R is increased, you get more RCF. That's why you still get a very good separation using, using the centrifugal force, but probably you are using too excessive force. So what you should keep is the same RCF. Okay, uh, I, I, I put it here that is especially when rotor size is different. I'll give you an example, okay? If you have two rotors to in, in, in two different centrifuge and you are using the same speed at 14,000 RPM, but the centrifuge has a different size, okay? Rotor A has the rotor, rotor A, okay, either this one or that one. The radius is only 5.98, but rotor B has a bigger radius. Using the same RPM will give you a different gravity force. Smaller rotor will give you a lower gravity force. Okay, so even though you said the same to the same speed, you use different rotor of different size, like smaller rotor will give you smaller force than a bigger rotor. So that is that is a main point for centrifugation, but but I I know that for our convenience, most of us um, when they use centrifuge, they um, just say how many RPM you use without saying um, how many g force you use. But I, I'm I'm talk about this in the future if you if you are doing it in. Um, higher education, or if you have to go in industry and you have to deal with this stuff, sometimes uh, RPM is might not be accepted. You need to understand about the G, okay? The two pictures I have here on the left is um, just to give you example of different type of, of rotor that, that, that they have in, in centrifugation, okay? Most of us use fixed angle rotor, but there is also what we call a swing bucket rotor as well. So it's the same, I mean, it's the same principle. Normally with the swing bucket rotor, you, you don't go to a very um, high rotational speed as a fixed angle rotor. So be, be, be aware in mind that the relative centrifugal force is not the same as RPM. And it's, I would say it's more important than the RPM itself. So. Um, this data is, 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 is the calculated data, but um, Merck and many places put it in the table for you. You see that the numbers here are the G-force, okay? You see that if you use that much RPM, but using different rotor with different radius, okay? You get a different G-force. For example, if you 10,000 and your rotor is small, you only get 4,472 G-force. But if you use like um, uh, twice as large, you get higher G-force. So RPM is less important than G-force in, in centrifuge. This is an example of a large scale centrifuge. I don't put in the pictures of small scale centrifuge because everyone is using it now. In large, in, in large scale separation using centrifuge, it, it is possible, okay? And um, in, in, in large scale, they tend to do the centrifugation so that they can do it continuously. So large scale centrifuge is not what you see in the lab, which is just um, uh, look like a washing machine with the big rotors and you have to get it in and get it out. So, so that's big, but not really a large scale just yet. This is one example. It is a tubular centrifuge. Okay, this is the picture, the, the actual pictures of the instrument itself. So what, what they have for, for an industrial scale is that they put the feed in, okay, and the inside has a motor and it rotate, developing the centrifugal force. And the heavy fraction will go toward the walls, okay? And they get separate. And the light fraction, which is the liquid, will go another way. So that's, that, that's how it works. So it's, it's actually just the design of the, of the machine itself. 
Another large scale centrifuge that is used is the disc ball or disc stack centrifuge. So this is a picture. This is a picture of, 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 of the machine itself, okay? So the disc stack is inside here and the motor is to generate the rotational speed. And this is like a thousand of disc stack on together. And they decided such that it, it flows, it flows in and the, centrif uh, the centrifugal force will force the, um, the solid out and the lighter part goes out here and it depends on the size. Somehow the liquid, the heavy liquid, which is the, um, the slurry, the, the more concentrated one going out here, sometimes it discharged out there. Okay, so that was cover how we separate the soluble and the insoluble, okay? Um, I'll go as much as I can for the cell, uh, the cell uh, breakage or the cell disintegration because we have something like, I think 10 minutes, right? We finish at 11.30. Okay, the cells, okay. If we separating things already and the cells is something that we want and the product is inside the cell, what are the options that you will make the cells to break and release those intracellular product? Okay, this is what we are going to talk. Now, let's see what we can do in about 10 minutes, okay? <laughs> so in cell disruption, um, the main function is to disintegrating cells to obtain the desired fraction, okay? Whether it is an intracellular product or if, you're, if you want to do something with the cells wall and those type of stuff, so you have to do cell disruption. Okay, so these are the example of the intracellular products that, that we, can, we, we can produce from the cells. It could be proteins if you want to produce um, intracellular enzyme, that will be the intracellular product. You need to know how to disrupt the cell without degrading the proteins of the enzyme, okay? Or it can be bioplastic, okay? This, the picture that you see is the PHA. It's a bioplastic. You have to break it out and then collecting the, the, the substance and then do further purification. Microbial oil, okay? Uh, some yeast, some bacteria, algae can accumulate oil. You can extract them out and then use it for something else like biodiesel production. It can uh, carotenoid. Carotenoid is um, an <coughs> antioxidant and it can be uh, accumulate also in microalgae and, and plant, okay? And then hormones. So these are intracellular products. If you're interested in producing any of this, you need to choose a right method to, to disrupt the cells and obtain the product, okay? So you need to know um, the good thing and the bad things about each of the process because some intracellular product is prone to heat, some is prone to um, acid or, or alkali status of, of the solution. Okay, and when you want to break the cells, there are basically two ways, okay? You can do it mechanically or you can do it non-mechanically. Okay, we are going to um, look briefly into each of them. For mechanical breakage of the cell, that's the term said mechanical, so you, you have to use force, okay? And the force can come from what we call solid shear and liquid shear. Solid shear is just like when you, when you fall down on the ground and then your skin is broken, that's solid shear, okay? Liquid shear is a little bit different, we'll talk about that. And the instrument that, that involved for each of these is also different. Like in the lab for solid shear, it could be just Pestle and mortar, okay? You can just break the cells like that, or you can use beads, the, the glass bead to break the cells. The liquid shear has um, a little different approach, okay? 
you you don't have to be experts on this just have the idea of what is available for you okay for non-mechanical the mechanism is the lysis when we say everybody is have heard the cells like this okay so basically you want to break whatever outside the cell okay but without mechanical force so you can use enzyme you can use chemical like detergent or solvent or you can use a physical lysis as well okay for mechanical method i'm comparing solid shear and liquid shear okay um the principle of the solid shear is they apply the phase change of the ice crystal and put it under the high pressure so that it forces the cells to break basically so you use high pressure very low temperature get every get the ice crystal and then push it through a small holes so that the cells break okay it is a direct mechanical force okay and and you can add beads so that you you can have it break better you have a knowledge of pt diagram maybe you have done that i'm, I'm not very sure but this is the word that you might you might have to think about because um, the pressure temperature diagram will tells you the structure of the ice so that you have a successful use of the ice crystal if you want the solid shear to work okay liquid shear is another thing a different one um you can use the homogenizer ultrasonic or, or, or agitation the mechanism for liquid shear is mostly what we call cavitation i'm going to explain a little bit next okay okay um cavitation okay cavitation is is when you have a rapid change in pressure okay and um, I put this picture in because if you, you you probably could imagine this is the blade of the impeller of of the ship a big ship is always underwater but if it moves fast okay there's pressure change along the blade and there is change that change in pressure could cause the bubble to happen without having any air in it because it moves so fast the pressure has changed so it forms bubble and that bubbles can burst and with the high pressure when when you when you move in fast the pressure change is a lot and it creates bubble and that bubbles could cause could explode and it put a lot of force into the thing that is close to it and it breaks. So that, that is what we call cavitation and, and the specific uh, is hydro cavitation or acoustic cavitation. It's, um, it's a word that you can look for in YouTube and find like some video is, is, is pretty entertaining actually. So this is just to get you some word for you for further research if you need to use um, these type of techniques. Okay, just a little bit to go through. I think we could um, cover the mechanical and then we finish the, um, the lysis next lecture with the rest of, of, of the lecture. This is the example of the, the instrument that is uh, that we use for cell disintegration using solid shear. This stuff is called the express which apply the ice shear that's what i uh, that's what i told you that we get um the cells into um, the ice uh to have the ice crystal inside a cell so when 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 they are pushed to a small safe or a small opening the cell break because of a, a large pressure and the ice in the cell just make everything shear okay <laughs> just tear apart so that's that is how it goes it's large pressure because you have to put a lot of pressure for a thing to go through a small holes that's why it is in the last pressure and it is low temperature because you have to introduce the ice 
this is another direct example of using solid shear for cell disintegration. This is a smaller laboratory scale, a larger scale, and a larger scale. Okay, it's a bit mills. So basically, for 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 this type of thing, you put a, a, a beads like whether it's a glass bead, ceramic beads, or metal beads. Okay, and get it move so fast, so it has a solid. Um, it has a shear force that um, destroy the cell wall and cell membrane. So it is also a direct mechanical force, just like the express I explained earlier. This is an example of liquid shear. Um, if you heard the word high pressure homogenizer, okay, homogenizer involve liquid shear, involve um, the formation of cavitation and then um, an explosion of small bubbles and give um, a, a high pressure and high force to break the cells. In high pressure homogenizer, you basically put your cell through a very small hole, that's high pressure. And then that cavitation will help breaking the cells, homogenize the cells. Okay, this is another example of liquid shear, but this time using ultrasonication. We, uh, um, you probably have this in your, in, in, in your lab because it's producing um, an ultrasonic wave and then making things having cavitation and then breaking the cell, okay? Larger scale is possible for this thing as well. All right, and um, I'll stop my lecture today here. We'll finish off this non-mechanical method of cell disintegration um, next week.